and video. So, we're going to go three dots from the scene on the phone. I'm going to go down for Frank Hozar. Not why me. And I'm going to make hosts. She's on Frank. She's on Frank's okay. computer. Yeah. Okay. And anything else? Speak up for me and Bruce. During the presentation. Should be there. Should we there? Are we good, Sarah? All right. Good evening, everybody. Our speaker this evening is Dr. Tom Middlebrook, a retired child and adolescent psychiatrist, a native and lifelong resident of Nacogdoches, and his family roots in the county go back to at least 1822. Tom holds degrees in geology, psychology, theology, medicine, and psychiatry. And you can talk about him with all those and all the schools he went to later. Tom has served as past president of the Dallas Archaeological Society and the Texas Archaeological Society. He was a co-founder of the East Texas Archaeological Society, the East Texas Archaeological Conference, and the East Texas Caddo Archaeological Research Group. He is a life member and fellow of the TAS and has been an archaeological steward for over 30 years. Tom was recipient of the Crabtree Award for the Society for American Archaeology in 2015. Um, Tom is going to be talking tonight about the search that lasted over five years by a team of professional and avocational archaeologists of the original 1716 site of Mission Nuestra Señora de la Parisma Concepción de los Hainos. I probably messed that up, which was located in 2010 in the village of the Hainai Kadi, which is the tribal leader. After summarizing what is known about the uh, Hassane Caddo and reviewing the early 18th century background of the French and Spanish in East Texas, his presentation will discuss the discovery and the archaeological investigations of the mission and what we're going to be doing at TAS Field School up there this coming June. Without further ado, Dr. Tom Middlebrook. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you for inviting me to come. I'm excited about uh, the uh, opportunity to be here. I spoke to HAS about 25 years ago, and I've known many of your members for many, many years, and, uh, uh, and HAS has had a major contribution uh, to Texas archaeology for many, many years. Uh, so I'm very happy to, to be uh, talking to you. Uh, so uh, you've already heard the abstract of what I'm going to be saying. I'll try to put some flesh on the bones uh, with regards. Okay, let me see. Now it's not advancing. <laughs> this. I will continue talking as soon as we get this figured out, but obviously I have to advance the, the uh, Now that works, but, but okay. I think we have it finished, <laughs> fixed. Okay, so this is the outline of my talk. First of all, I want to talk about the significance of Mission Nuestra Señora de la Purisima Concepción de la Heine. Uh, that word is Heine. Uh, I mispronounced it for 40 years, and I have been corrected, and now I know how to pronounce it uh, from the Caddo themselves. Uh, secondly, we'll talk about the historical background, and then we'll talk about actually how did we discover it and what was our kickoff. And then uh, we'll talk about their four sites as a part of the uh, uh, Mission Concepcion complex, and uh, we will cover uh, the details of that. That's going to be at the very heart and soul of the uh, TAS Field School this next year. So I want to be sure to go through that. And lastly, I'm going to give some other ideas about the uh, the uh, 20. 
2023 uh, field school and uh, where we're going to camp, et cetera. So uh, I really want to encourage you to consider coming because I think this is, uh, as I hope I can demonstrate to you, one of the more important archaeological sites in the state. Uh, so let's talk about that, the significance of this particular site. Uh, it is the earliest known uh, European site in all of East Texas because it is the earliest yet discovered mission, Spanish mission in Spanish Texas. Uh, Texas is a big state, but Spanish Texas is kind of the southeastern uh, half or, uh, of our state. And, uh, and so there are things in El Paso that are definitely older. They go back uh, to the previous century. But in Spanish Texas, it is the oldest yet discovered Spanish mission. It also was the first headquarters of, uh, of a series of six missions. Um, and uh, it, was re uh, it was located in the village of the, uh, uh, the Cadi of the Hene. The Hene was the lead tribe of the Hesine Caddo. I'll explain what all that means in a moment. But, uh, uh, and uh, the Spanish in, uh, uh, Governor Alarcon uh, uh, referred to it as the capital of the Tejas. If you want to know what Hacine Caddo is, it's the Tejas Caddo uh, of East Texas, the Angelian Nature's uh, drainage. And this, uh, the lead tribe of the Hesine were the Hene and their principal leader was the Kadi. And uh, it was there that they put the, uh, the uh, headquarters of the first four Spanish missions uh, in East Texas to have some permanency to them. It's also the only site that Angelina, who I will try to convince you was, a, well, she was the first important woman in uh, Texas history. Uh, it was also the only place uh, on earth that was ever named from, for the lady in blue or the flying nun. We'll talk about her. And it's the original site uh, of San Antonio's uh, Mission Concepcion, which many, maybe all of you, have visited in San Antonio. It's a World Heritage Site, uh, an important site, but it started in Nacogdoches County. When they're too long, but we want to talk about uh, that uh, location. And uh, it also, the El Camino Real de la Tejas uh, was uh, started uh, uh, at San Juan Batista, uh, Presidio of San Juan Batista, actually started in Mexico City, went up to uh, uh, Presidio of San Juan Batista, south of the Rio Grande, and then it uh, curved and uh, came up to East Texas. And, uh, and this was uh, the headquarters that they were uh, shooting for when they first arrived there in 1716. Any discussion of historical background really has to start with the Hesine Caddo. Uh, uh, this group of Indians, uh, of Native Americans, were uh, very prominent, uh, uh, and they were tremendous potters. Uh, they, had, they were eloquent of speech. They had, uh, they had significant diplomatic capabilities, and they were feared warriors by other uh, groups uh, around uh, the state. Uh, they, uh, uh, obviously, they were agriculturalist. They built mounds, uh, and they were a um, mild to moderately hierarchical society. They occupied uh, all of East Texas, and the surrounding states. Everything that's in uh, on this map uh, was really a part of uh, their territory. Uh, the gentleman uh, on the right is the Grand Chinesi. Uh, there may have been more than one Grand Chinesi depending on the region, but he was the principal leader over uh, a, a, a widely distributed uh, group of several uh, villages or settlements, each of which had their own principal leader, the Kadi. Uh, I'll go back for a second. You'll notice that when the Europeans first arrived in the late 1600s and early 1700s, there was uh, two major uh, groups, formerly known as confederacies in the literature, but they're really a collection of uh, villages. The ones up on the uh, Red River were the Cato Adocho and the uh, Natchitoches. And in East Texas, the Angelina Natchez Basin were the Tejas or 
Hasine uh, Caddo, which had nine to 12 different affiliated groups. Uh, you notice the great area in between those two collections. Uh, there's no villages that are noted. Well, that's not really uh, accurate. Uh, if you go back historically, if you go from 1000 AD, all of these texts had uh, the Caddo. However, De Soto came in in the 1540s. Some have speculated that uh, uh, European diseases uh, had a major impact, and perhaps one of the reasons that there are relatively few historic Caddo in the regions between Angelina Natchez and the Red River is because of the disease impact. The Caddo area was positioned from a colonial standpoint in between two great European empires uh, claims. Of course, the real claim that's important is the Hesine Caddo, that they had uh, their own area and they had their own kingdom. In fact, it was referred to as the kingdom of the Teos. But from a European uh, perspective, the, the Caddo area uh, was interposed uh, on the uh, frontier between French and Spanish uh, regions. So uh, things got complicated in the 1680s when this gentleman, uh, Sur de la Salle, uh, came down uh, from Canada, down the Mississippi River, and discovered the mouth of the Mississippi uh, River in 1681. He went back to France uh, and uh, 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 procured uh, the support of the king and brought, uh, I think, four ships. Uh, one, I think, uh, left uh, in uh, Cuba. And uh, uh, so they were going to head uh, from Cuba to the mouth of the Mississippi, as you probably all know, missed, uh, went several hundred miles and found Matagorda Bay and uh, set up uh, uh, Fort St. Louis which was not a very successful project. Uh, many people died, uh, snake bites, uh, uh, interactions with Native Americans and other reasons. So he takes off in several different directions trying to uh, get back ultimately uh, to, uh, to France. I think he also went exploring off to the West, but uh, he uh, went up uh, to uh, from uh, uh, Garcetas Creek and near Matagorda Bay and headed up uh, north, northeast and came into the kingdom of the Tejas. There he went to the westernmost village of those nine uh, uh, tribes there to the Nabadachi village, which they called Les Sinis, or the French call it Sinis, and there's a famous uh, Gatlin uh, painting, as you'll see here. Uh, they turn around and go back to get other provisions and organize themselves and uh, head back trying to get to the Mississippi River overland. But um, uh, LaSalle was uh, an, an unpleasant uh, personality uh, to some of the people who followed him, and he was assassinated near Navasota, Texas, we think, uh, or it's believed. But uh, uh, under the leadership of Henri Jotel, uh, they proceeded on and they went back to the Nabadachi village uh, and uh, then to the Nasoni village, back up to the Red River and then uh, uh, to the Mississippi and ultimately back uh, to France. Uh, so the Spanish hear about all of this and are deeply, deeply troubled. And so they sent out multiple missions to find this French incursion into their land. Uh, almost all of them turned back or are unsuccessful. Uh, but eventually the Spanish organized themselves by uh, 1690 and send a larger contingent and set up two missions, uh, San Francisco and Maria uh, on, uh, on San Pedro Creek which is a tributary to the Natchez River, and then one on the Natchez River. This, too, was ultimately very unsuccessful. And eventually, the Caddo were uh, unhappy uh, enough that they ran them all the way back out of the state. 
and uh, and Texas did not have a European presence of any significance uh, for two and a half decades thereafter. This was the first failed Spanish attempt uh, uh, for mission activity. However, one of the uh, padres, uh, Father Hidalgo, was deeply compa uh, compassionate for the Caddos, and he took it on himself to write the uh, French governor, even though he was Spanish, uh, and wanted to go back and Christianize. Uh, and perhaps uh, some people wanted to do uh, commercial activities as well. So uh, Governor Cadillac from Mobile sent out... Uh, 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 Louis Jusereau de Saint-Denis, uh, a, uh, a Frenchman, uh, and uh, who knew the Caddo area, uh, even of East Texas, where he had been exploring and trading a little bit in the early, early 1700s. And so in 1714, they went up the Red River and established a post at Natchitoches, which is, by the way, the oldest European settlement in all of the Louisiana purpose. That's a big chunk of the current United States. Uh, but uh, saint Denis was quite uh, uh, an impressive uh, fellow, and he decides he wants to go uh, down to uh, Mexico and engage uh, with the uh, Spanish there, and he makes it all the way uh, to San Juan Bautista, south of the Rio Grande, and uh, he gets arrested but he's a clever guy and ends up marrying the step-granddaughter of, uh, of the uh, Presidio uh, uh, Commandant. And uh, you probably know all of this, but this is pretty crucial background history. And so the uh, Spanish organize a, a mission establishing uh, expedition under Domingo Ramon, who was the son of Diego Ramon, the Commandant. And so they take along the president father of the Franciscan College in Zacatecas, Zacatecas uh, who was uh, Antonio Maril de Jesus, uh, and the president father of the Franciscan uh, College at Corretoro, uh, who uh, was uh, 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 Felix de Espinosa, and they head out for East Texas. Uh, and uh, they established four missions that year in 1716. And, um, uh, uh, and then the, uh, later that year and the next year, they established two more. Uh, these missions were not overwhelmingly successful and a drought started and the Padres were literally beginning to starve. They sent out word trying to get uh, help but it was not until 1718 uh, and uh, all the way through early 1719 when uh, the governor, now Governor Alarcon, uh, uh, sends out and goes uh, for a resupply. You know, uh, at one part of this, uh, of this 1718 expedition by the governor established in San Antonio, but there were already, and it was to be kind of a way station to supply uh, the missions in East Texas. Uh, so he goes and uh, visits all these. He stays 18 days at Mission Concepcion, which was now the headquarters of the East Texas missions, and he renamed the uh, native uh, village there and the mission together is Pueblo Concepcion de Agreda. We'll talk about that. Uh, then he leaves and then the very next year, uh, Lieutenant Blondell, uh, an enterprising French lieutenant over at Natchitoches, goes and does a little raid uh, at uh, Presidio Los Adias, uh, 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 14 miles from Natchitoches which was where uh, one of the uh, missions was located. And uh, uh, they capture a, uh, uh, one of uh, uh, the deacons, the Spanish deacons, and, uh, and several chickens, I think, died, and so, thus called the Great Chicken War. But the Spanish start running back from one uh, a wonderful uh, uh, mission to another saying the French are coming, the French are coming, and they all fall back. Eventually, they fall all the way back to uh, Mission Concepcion. Then most of the folks leave, and then finally 
uh, the two president fathers uh, follow and they go back to San Antonio. Uh, uh, but then the new governor, Governor uh, Aguayo, pulls together about 500 troops and some families and several thousand uh, head of livestock of all manner, and they uh, have a uh, entrada into Texas to resupply these missions and reestablish them, and they do. The three western missions, which are Mission Concepcion on the Natchez River, Mission Concepcion, which we'll be talking about tonight on the Angelina, and San Jose to the Nasoni, which is on the upper uh, uh, Angelina, are pulled back uh, to San Antonio. There also is a Western Presidio, Presidio Dolores de la Tejas. We hope to find that soon. And when we do, it'll be the oldest Spanish fort in Texas uh, that could rise to that level. Uh, the, these are where these missions were. You will see from the right uh, where it says the Nacadochi. Uh, that was Mission Guadalupe. Then, uh, then a group to the Hene, which is uh, the mission we'll be talking about, is uh, Concepcion, uh, Mission Concepcion. Uh, further to the west uh, was Mission San Francisco. And then up to the north uh, uh, is Mission San Jose. And then these three in 1731 moved to San Antonio and are today the famous uh, San Juan Capistrano, which was uh, Mission uh, Concepcion de Acuna and uh, San Francisco de la Espada, all in uh, San Antonio. But they got their start in East Texas. So let's now talk about the discovery of uh, uh, Mission Concepcion uh, uh, or Pueblo Concepcion de Agreda, if you'd like. That's what it looks like when it's all cleaned up and nice. Uh, it's quite beautiful, can be like a park. I don't know that that will be exactly the way it will be this summer when you come, because it will be greened up at that point. And uh, at times it's like a jungle, uh, but we will try to have it as cleaned up as possible. Uh, this uh, uh, effort, which took us five years to find, was really inspired by Jim Corbin, Dr. Jim Corbin, from Stephen F. Austin University, uh, having encouraged me back in the 70s and then in the last few years of his life to go out and look for Mission Concepcion. He passed away uh, in 2004, but the next March, I made a commitment to find Mission Concepcion. But to do that, I pulled together a large team of folks. Perhaps key to that is the first gentleman you see on the, uh, is uh, with the white t-shirt, and that is uh, uh, Dr. Morris Jackson. He's a MD, MD PhD, he's a radiologist, uh, but uh, a very brilliant historian in my opinion. And we collaborated beginning uh, in 2006, and he certainly is a co-discoverer. Next to him is Dr. George Avery, a, uh, a staff archeologist, uh, is Stephen F. Austin, an historic archaeologist, and he taught us everything we uh, know about historic archaeology, and he helped very much in our in our search. Um, immediately below those two are uh, uh, Bo Nelson and Mark Walters, who've done more Caddo archaeology than any other two human beings in East Texas history. Uh, to your right, uh, uh, is Jeff Williams, who uh, was a student of Jim Corbin, and he is an expert on El Camino Real de la Tejas and uh, is a very, very bright and helpful guy. The other group of folks there is just a, a, a steward uh, group I pulled together. Uh, and what clues we had about where it would be found is it would be about uh, a half a league uh, to the east of the Angelina River. Early on, it was known as Santa Barbara, but it was about a east, uh, a half a league. Uh, and it also was near two flowing or bubbling springs that were not big enough to supply the needs of the village, or at least that was the impression at the time by the uh, Spanish chroniclers. Once we found another document, which had never been translated into English until we did, uh, was a possession document. 
that uh, Domingo Ramon uh, gave to the Padres, giving them possession. And in it, it had some new pieces of inform geographical information. One is that it was located on a north-south mesa, east of the, Cat a, uh, the main Caddo village, and uh, that the uh, springs were on the margin of that mesa, and uh, that one of the, the springs flowed into a little marshy area. Those turned out to really uh, give us all the information uh, we needed uh, to confirm after we actually found it. Prior to our searching in the field, there were three ideas. Uh, one was put forward by the very famous University of Texas historian, uh, Herbert Bolton, who said that it was up near the uh, uh, Linwood Crossing on the northern route. Turns out that El Camino Real uh, is a braided road, and there's at different places two or three appropriate routes of that road. One was the northern road. Uh, Jim Corbin came along and found a map of uh, uh, Juan Pedro Walker, and he discovered there was a southern route. And uh, so he, uh, as you can see where the arrow points, uh, noted a, uh, a location that he believed it would be. Unfortunately, Dr. Corbin passed away before he could check that out. So that's the first place I went. I spent a year looking out this Southern theory that he had. Uh, one other person of importance uh, was uh, R.B. Blake, the county clerk, very famous county clerk of Nacogdoches County, who pulled together the huge Blake collection of Spanish uh, materials. And in 1936, he placed uh, the historical marker there to the south. All three were wrong. It turned out to be there, that red dot, which is kind of in the middle of the two. But believe me, we had searched everything north of there and everything south and went to this, this final 900 acres of land belonging to Ben and Bell Gallant. And had it not been on their property, we it would probably still be lost. Uh, but we knocked on his door and uh, asked him, and, uh, uh, and uh, he's a... Uh, He's a very proud and wonderful Texan, and he allowed us to go out there, and uh, as long as we'd check in with him before and let us know when he was coming, that was great. And I, to this day, do that. Did that this week, as a matter of fact. Uh, and he asked us not to bring anybody from the government out there, but we've had such a d wonderful relationship with him, and he and his wife have been so supportive of archaeology. I brought every person I know of that works for the state of Texas government out there, and it's all been okay. And uh, and he's passed away in, uh, a year or two ago, but Belle is still there living on the land, and she is very excited. By the way, we found a total of 14 archaeological sites on his land, there may be more, but uh, there are some key ones, four in particular, which we will be talking about. On uh, In uh, May of uh, 2010, uh, I took uh, 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 Bo and Mark and Chet Walker, who you'll see in a minute, and uh, we walked over a spot that uh, um, uh, Dr. Jackson and I had walked over 10 times before, but Bo and Mark can see stuff. Uh, and they saw a couple of pieces of pottery and a little, uh, I think you'd call it a mission point broken. And they picked it up and this is a site we had never seen before. So five days later, Dr. Jackson and I went back and with our metal detectors, we found some forged nails. That was it, that was the clue. Uh, there was also a musket ball and a pintle, which is a, uh, a, a something that you hang doors and, uh, uh, and windows with. So I'm going to show you several uh, pictures of the four sites, which are on this north-south mesa. And you can see where that is. It's about a half a league away from the river. It's uh, next to the Hainé village and just to the east of it. And there are uh, several springs coming off of that mesa, one down into a, a marsh, which we call Ben's Marsh, because from uh, the 18th century till today, it is marshy. And Ben said to me, you know, that thing never goes dry. And it still doesn't. Uh, and so we named it after him. So these are four sites, which we call the mission complex. 
The mission itself is the Gallon Falls site because there were some waterfalls nearby. Uh, and uh, it is the, the mission proper. To its north are two other sites which we call mission related because there are Spanish colonial materials there, but there's mostly uh, uh, cattle, uh, uh, Hene materials there. Uh, we believe that the uh, Spanish interacted with them. They may have been either Spanish houses or they uh, like for the soldiers, or more likely they were uh, the part of the Caddo village. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then there was the, the, uh, the hayfield, which we call the Hayne Hayfield, which is where we believe the primary village was located. I'm showing you this just to show you a LIDAR scan of those uh, four sites superimposed on this north-south uh, mesa. Uh, and uh, and the floodplain, uh, it's not a uh, floodplain that's flooded, but it's next to the adjacent to the floodplain. This is just to show that this fell in the far right lower uh, 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 slide, which is Dr. Chet Walker, uh, who's a well-known uh, archaeogeophysicist, uh, came out and has done magnetometer surveys on all four of these sites. I will tell you that the lower two uh, sites there, that is the uh, Hene village and the mission proper, the, it, the geophys was not so helpful, but the upper two was very helpful as you'll see. Uh, we've had many field studies out there, uh, field schools uh, and other activities uh, over the last uh, uh, dozen years or so, and here's just some of those. So let's talk about each of these four sites, beginning with uh, uh, Gallant Falls site. Uh, there you see Dr. Jackson standing out. We're taking this from the other end, looking uphill uh, and uh, imagining what it might have looked like uh, 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 three centuries ago uh, and uh, four centuries ago, I guess. Um, and uh, uh, three centuries ago, excuse me. Uh, then uh, this uh, on the left uh, superimposes a staked out 60 by 60 meter unit, which encompasses, we believe, most of the mission proper. We later found in the 20 by 20 to the southwest that there were some additional materials there, but most of that uh, was military gear. You also can see that there is a topographic map to on the magnetometer survey, which is not too helpful, but the but I put that there to show you that the um, uh, that the mission itself is is on a slope. It turns out that almost every other Spanish uh, mission or presidio site, particularly presidio Los Adais, they're all on slopes. They're well drained, I guess. Uh, they're not steep slopes, but they're gentle slopes. Uh, excavation was not very useful. After five centimeters, you hit clay. However, in that five centimeter, centimeters, you can find a ton of stuff. And uh, so this is just to give an example of what you might be digging uh, this summer. Uh, lots of material, but it's shallow. And it's uh, at this site, uh, we then realizing that there was so uh, little uh, depth to their uh, to the uh, material there, uh, we decided that we would do a systematic metal detection of this 60 by 60 meter square unit and then locate everything to the centimeter. These are uh, the nails and other um, uh, architectural elements, and they cluster into three clusters. The middle cluster, we believe, is the church. I'll explain that in a minute. And the one to the northwest uh, in the uh, upper left uh, is probably where the Padres lived and the residents. The one uh, in the lower right actually probably was a shed that got pushed over. Uh, it was storage and it's kind of tumbling down a little hill. Uh, we have done some scraping. Uh, and but I think in the process it's not been as helpful as we thought it would be, uh, except in the upper right we found in this area this revealed a number of things uh, that made us believe it's the residents 
of one of the Padre, or of the Padres. One, we found a broken Mexican volcanic rock, either a mono or uh, the leg of the Moncajete, which is what I think it is. We also found our only glass there, this very classic, very, very dark green, early 18th century glass, and we found some glass beads as well. Uh, we believe all of this suggests uh, residential activity. I want to talk to you a little bit about the material culture that you may be finding. The vast majority of the material culture is Native American. This is Caddo. This is, uh, uh, and there's really two groups of Caddo uh, uh, material culture. One is ceramics and the other is lithics. So I, wanna, I want you just to see it and hear it because about 60 to 70% of the sherds are brushed, as you see on the left. Brushed, and that high percentage is very characteristic of this historic uh, Caddo, this region. But there are some uh, typable uh, other sherd types, such as patent and gray, which is quintessential of uh, early 18th century Caddo. There's a king and gray named from a site about three miles away, the Tim Pertola, uh, based this uh, type on. There's also a Mayhew rectilinear based on the Mayhew site. I, I actually came up with that. And then there's a Lindsay grooved and Spradley brushed in size. You'll become familiar with that uh, because uh, cattle pottery is, is pretty important to this study. There's also lithics. There are three local sources of lithic material. One is quartzite, which is usually a kind of red, pink, or gray. There is the local, we call it Red Tan Creek Church uh, or Jasper, uh, and uh, 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 that you'll see. But petrified wood is extremely common. It's plentiful in the area as a raw material, and a lot of things are made of that. But they're also importing in this historic period in the early 1700s a lot of Central Texas, Georgetown flints, uh, as you'll see on the right. Uh, but the European materials is also fascinating because this, after all, did confirm that we were finding a Spanish mission. I mean, if we didn't find any European materials, we couldn't do that. So this is what has uh, convinced uh, every Spanish colonial expert that we presented it to way back there in 2010 and 11, that yes, you've got the mission. Uh, lots and lots of, uh, of French trade guns and Spanish uh, guns. There's really most of this is French because they're getting it from Saint Denis, who had his trading post about five miles away over on Bao Loco. We've also found his trading post, uh, and it has a, a tremendous amount of stuff. 42 gun parts were found altogether, a little bit of every single part of trade guns, as you'll see there. The quintessential thing here is over on the right, you'll uh, see a trigger guard, which has a Chevrolet design, which is Texas steward uh, J. Blaine uh, named that uh, 50 years ago or more. Uh, there's some horse gear, some Spanish horse gear material, uh, uh, horseshoe nails, uh, spoon set uh, jingles, a uh, number of French knives have been found there. Uh, there's uh, a part, we believe, of a Spanish uh, box that might have, this was all found in the area where we believe the church was, and we believe perhaps it was one of the boxes maybe where vestments or other things were stored. Here are some others. There's the far right uh, uh, object is a handle of a uh, chocolatier, which is Spanish liked, uh, and a uh, 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 a you know I showed you a pencil earlier. Well, that went through that I uh, 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 my nominal aphasia is hitting me. Uh, but it's an architectural element. There was a big chain found, uh, which was compared to uh, to one from the Mayhew site and from Presidio Los Adias. Uh, lots of copper here, lots and lots, because the French, they would trade with the French, so they get their uh, nested kettles, and then both the Spanish and the Indians would cut all that up to do all sorts of things like making tinklers. Lots of lead here. Uh, the uh, study at the bottom is early on when we only had 17, later we found 38 
uh, lead objects. Uh, and But they fell into those groups, kind of the larger uh, 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 47 to 52, 55 caliber uh, lead balls, a smaller, a smaller uh, group, uh, and then uh, some other pieces of, of lead and even a lead seal. Uh, we took some of those and using Stephen Schooler, who got uh, did a brilliant, in my opinion, a brilliant a master's thesis at Texas Tech, where he would drill little holes, take a little bit of lead out, uh, and then uh, that would be dissolved and then put through a multi-collector inductively coupled um, uh, plasma mass spectrometer. Say that five times real fast. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, basically what you can do is you can get the relative amounts of the four natural uh, isotopes of lead, lead 204, 206, 7, and 8. And then you can put those various uh, uh, quantities into ratios, and then you can put two ratios and make a scatter plot. This is uh, what uh, this uh, uh, lead isotope analysis results in, and you can actually make clusters. And it turns out that the signature for uh, the Mexican lead that the Spanish may have had and the European lead Oh, not necessarily from France, it might have been from England or Germany, the Hearts Mountains, et cetera. They clustered separately. And then from uh, the American Midcontinent, Missouri, there's some lead there. And we found actually one in this analysis uh, at the Mayhew site, we found one uh, lead ball that uh, was from there, which we think was brought in somewhat later. But um, but if you look at the relative amounts, both at the Spanish Mission Concepcion, as Spanish as you get, they have almost equal amounts of French and Spanish lead. And at the French site, San Denis site, they had almost equal amounts of Spanish and French lead. Our thought in all of this is the mediators in all of this exchange is a Hassine Caddo. They were who were in charge. You know, the Spanish and French could have all the hubris they wanted, but at that time, it was the, the natives, and they were trading actively with both, and they were kind of forced to get along with each other, by the way, even though they were enemies elsewhere. Uh, and uh, so, and the French lead really gives us a extra piece of data regarding that. So that's a part of our research. So in 1936, we moved uh, the misplaced uh, uh, 1936 stone up to the mission. Let me just briefly go through these other sites. The Ben Gallon site is totally fascinating because it is not only a mission-related site, it is also a site in the mid-19th century when a fellow who uh, uh, a graduate of the Texas Revolution, Levi Dykes, put his homestead there. So there's a mixture of materials from the 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, uh, we discovered a pit, and that pit, uh, this is one of our first discoveries, was filled. This is one level of one-fourth, uh, I mean, this is like one-sixteenth of all the contents of that pit. And you can see on the, over on the far left is cattle shirt, uh, shirts, and then immediately next to it is all of Lee Di Levi Dykes and his wife's material. Beautiful stuff. And then there's uh, forged nails and later machine cut nails and a pipe of Caddo and a pipe of a clay pipe of uh, the Americans, uh, the Anglos, lots of bone, hot rocks, other things like that. It's great stuff. So we got a magnetometer survey. I want you to look at the lower right hand area. You will see a circle of uh, Okay, here we go. Well, I gotta, well, I gotta take the part back now. Oh yeah. It's all right, I think. Oh good. Okay. There's a circle of dark spots here. These are all post holes of the cattle house. And I just briefly want to tell you what I, we think that might be. Um, uh, uh, by the way, th those are lots of post holes and a lot of structures. Some of that's Levi Dykes and some of it is cattle. That's the bottom line. 
uh, we uh, ground truth those things, as you can see with our excavations, and nice little post holes showed up and some little pits. And here's uh, about four that uh, showing that we can do cross sections. Of, and this summer, some folks are going to have an opportunity to discover post holes and uh, do cross sections. Uh, pretty good. We found a hearth there on the left uh, with ash and hardened clay. The one on the right uh, is actually a, uh, a hot rock pit, uh, all of that. Then uh, 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 Chet uh, found this circle that I showed you just a minute ago. In the middle uh, is a house, and he said, this is as classic of a Caddo house I've ever seen. And so we uh, excavated down to it, and we did a cross-section. No question, that's what it is. That's a center post. The problem is there's no hearth there. There's almost no relatively few artifacts inside this house. And so we came up with this idea, and I don't know if it's true, it's a speculation, we'll study it this summer. And that is, we know from the historical record that during those 18 days that uh, Governor Alarcon was in this village, they built him a new house. They did it in a day or just a day or two, and he lived there for 18 days. Could this be Governor Alarcon's uh, house? It was then that he renamed the community for uh, uh, for the flying nun. So who is she? Maria de Jesus de Herrera, uh, and she was a Franciscan nun that uh, was in the order of the Immaculate Conception. She's famous because she wrote a, a six-part uh, biography of the Virgin Mary, who she reportedly received direct information about. She had the capacity for bilocation. She's known throughout the southwestern United States. Her body was said to be incorruptible. She is, by the way, uh, where the blue bonnet is said to come from. You can see on the lower uh, left a, a picture of her incorruptible body, and that's her uh, where she lived. She went throughout the southwestern uh, United States. But in 1690, uh, uh, Father Massenet, who was talking with the, um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, chief uh, over on San Pedro Creek, and he said, I want some blue material. My mother's about to die. And uh, uh, the priest said, why do you want blue? And he said, well, because a lady in blue came in my mother's childhood. And uh, and visited from the heights, and uh, and so blue is a very popular seed bead color, as a research by George Avery shows to the right. The Bell Gallon site is uh, about 300 meters away. It's the second of these four sites, and on this site we did a bunch of excavations, and I want to just show you there are two structures we found. Uh, this is where the kids' unit is probably going to be. Uh, and, for example, we found a post hole up in the upper right of the unit. I'm sorry for all the roots, but trees grow roots, I guess, and we had to cut through those. But in the fill of that clearly Caddo post hole were two forged nails from the, from the 1700s and a blue bead. How much more con convinced do you have to be that uh, that was uh, connected? This is the other structure. We also found a hearth. And we call it uh, Angelina's hearth, uh, uh, but because in and around it were about 12 different arrow points. Turns out Angelina had a couple of sons, and we uh, have speculated tongue-in-cheek that her, uh, uh, her two sons did in the house the same thing my brother and I did when we shot BB guns in the house. They were shooting their bows and arrows. We don't know, but I'll say this. No other place at that site did we find so many concentrated arrows. And by the way, finding arrows around hearths and Caddo houses is not really a common thing at all. But in this one, it was. Uh, Angelina was the first important woman in Texas history. Uh, uh, we know that she was... Uh, uh, apparently in 1690, taken uh, maybe with her brother uh, down to uh, Monclova, and she became a Christian. She was a translator. She was widely known as learned and sagacious, and she was a key diplomatic translator. She wasn't just a translator. She was a diplomat 
really helping two cultures uh, interact with, with her. Uh, there are all sorts of uh, descriptions of her uh, uh, in a very sultry sort of way that uh, she was a young maiden and her beauty was emphasized uh, in part because of this telling of Francois uh, uh, de Belle in 1720 uh, when he described her uh, nursing him back to health. There's a long story there and I, because our time is short, I won't go into it. Uh, the the Hainey uh, Hay, Hayfield is where we believe that the uh, chief's village was. We may or may not do archaeological work there, but if you'll see in the 1939 aerial photograph to the right, that darkly stained area, we believe that's where the village was. And we have found a couple of post holes out there with very limited work. Uh, we have found evidence of architecture there. So the plans for this summer is we're going to, uh, uh, by the way, Dr. Tamara Walter uh, is going to be the principal investigator, along with being the uh, president of the Texas Archaeological Society. We're very proud for her uh, doing these things. And uh, uh, she is going to use a two by two meter uh, excavation unit and 10 centimeter and perhaps uh, uh, going down to 20 centimeters at Gallant Falls. She's also going to uh, uh, do some work on the houses. But the children are going to be at the Bell Gallant site. Uh, camping is going to be at the head uh, and the field school headquarters will be at the Nacogdoches County Expo Exposition Center. Uh, and their family activities that can be had. That's the exposition center. There's a lot of camping space there, by the way. And there's uh, and there's 60 hookups with electricity uh, and water. Uh, you'll have to pour out your own sewerage. But the other two things you'll have, uh, most people know how to do that last. There is a pavilion where we'll be meeting. There's some other areas where we merchandising can be done. And... Uh, relative to most TAS field schools, there are going to be spa showers available in the afternoon. And we had to negotiate to get this. Um, and uh, so I threw that in. Uh, in the afternoons, if you want to run over to Lake Nacogdoches, uh, it's great fishing. That's one of our minnows that was found. You should see our fish. Um, and then there is a uh, there's a splash kingdom for the kids if they want to go. So we're going to welcome you to Nacogdoches and hope that you have a great time. Uh, we understand that there's going to be a, a a wonderful cold front go, come through that week, and so this kind of Arctic weather that we're having today, just get used to it because that's what you'll have the whole time. Our ticks don't come out to August, and. Uh, uh, and you'll just have a great time. And we look forward to you coming. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks. I forgot there's some nerds out there who actually want to learn more. I'm going to quickly go through these slides. Here are some books. Uh, uh, Foster's great book, Chipman's book. and uh, and But if you want to learn about the Caddo, I'd pick up this book, Caddo Indians, where we came from. If any of you ever knew Seal Carter, she was absolutely a wonderful person, and she tells the story from the Caddo perspective. Another awesome resource is to go to Texas Beyond History, which has what would amount to a textbook on Caddo archaeology, and it goes deeper and deeper and deeper. You just have to keep clicking. These are four great books. Uh, Swanton is a classic. If you want to know about Caddo archaeology, the one by Tim Pirtle on the far right is excellent as well. Thank you. Absolutely, and the kids are gonna, yeah. and the kids are gonna go. Yeah, you just rebuilt the, uh, the grass house up there, the visitor center that was destroyed four years ago. Tornado should be open by June. We hope. Yes, it will be open by June. Okay. Right. So, so first, let me just see if there are any questions. The bathroom, and that goes for you too, Tom. I know you got to drive home. Yeah. The bathrooms are closing in about five minutes or uh, seven minutes. So please use those. And we're going to get, but if you have some questions, go yeah. ahead and ask Tom that, please. Sarah, do you have any questions from YouTube? I do not. Okay. okay. We don't have any questions from from Zoom. Are there any questions in the room for Tom? I have a question. Sure. How did you zero in on the Gallant 
Fine. Well, we had, uh, it was a process of elimination. We had gone everywhere from the upper end to the south and from the lower end to the north. It was the last track of land. It was the very last one. And with one owner. Good and job so, on that. So. Was, was the metal detecting speed than, than excavations or? At the mission itself, at the Ben and the Bell Gallant sites where these missions, they have uh, some nice stratigraphy there. And uh, excavation is, is, you know, 30, 40 centimeters, uh, et cetera. But at the, you know, this is how deep much of the mission is. So what uh, Tamara's going to do is open up large swaths of territory. Because any crew can go through a two by two pretty quickly. And right. hopefully we'll have a lot of crews. And she wants to open up. We're going to be looking for post holes and uh, looking uh, for other architectural evidence. And if we get lucky, maybe even a pit. How big and would be post holes? About like this. I would say 20 centimeters around. Okay, that's pretty good size. Any other questions? It's encouraging because I know I'm not a YouTube star. So that's good. <laughs> and so. Well, Tom, okay. we really appreciate Thank the work Thank you, you did. Sure. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very okay. much. All right. Well, we'll. Bye. Bye. Bye.